Hello. In this video, we are going to introduce what is arguably the most important of the continuous random variables, namely the normal random variable. By the end of the video, you should thus be able to explain why the normal random variable is so important, and you should be able to write out the probability density function for the normal random variable. Before we get onto that, however, let's first review all the other random variables that we have encountered thus far in this course that are listed on this slide. The first random variable that we encountered was the Bernoulli trial, which we said was a discrete random variable that could be used to model the outcome of an experiment with two possible outcomes, success or failure. We then considered adding together Bernoulli trials and thus encountered the binomial random variable, which we said could be used to model the number of successes in n independent Bernoulli trials. By, a, by similarly considering multiple Bernoulli trials, we also arrived at the geometric and negative binomial random variables. We said that the ge geometric random variable gives the number of independent Bernoulli trials that had to be performed before a single success and that the negative binomial random variable was a random variable that measured the number of trials that would have to be observed before exactly k successes were obtained. We next moved away from these variables based on multiple Bernoulli trials and introduced the concept of a trial that could have more than two possible outcomes. Furthermore, we said that if we performed multiple such trials and counted the number of times each of these possible outcomes came up, we were essentially sampling from a multinomial distribution. This brought us to the end of all the discrete random variables that we wanted to look at, and we thus moved on to looking at continuous random variables. The first of these that we encountered was the uniform random variable. We saw that uniform random variables always fall within a particular range, and that all the numbers in that range are equally likely to occur if the random variable is uniformly distributed. We then talked about how we can use random variables to model time-dependent processes. In particular, we introduced the exponential random variable to model the time that we are required to wait until a random event occurred. Furthermore, we stated that this type of random variable had the important property of having no memory. In other words, this no memory property ensured that the length of time that we will have to wait for the random event to occur does not depend on the amount of time that we have already waited. Lastly, we introduced the Poisson random variable and said that this random variable could be used to model the number of events that have occurred by time t. The point I want to make by going over all this old material is that it is clear how each of the random variables that we have introduced thus far can be used to model a particular scenario that we might encounter in the real world. Each of them is derived in order to work out the probability for a particular event that might occur in a particular experiment. You probably already know, however, that in statistics, the bell-shaped distribution shown in this graph, the normal distribution, is very important. The probability density function for this type of random variable is given by the expression shown on the slide. It is therefore reasonable to ask where this distribution comes from. In other words, what phenomenon can we model using this particular distribution? Why would we use this distribution in place of the Bernoulli, binomial, geometric, negative binomial, uniform, exponential and Poisson distributions that we have seen thus far? The answer to this question is quite remarkable. It is possible to show that if we generate a series of identical and independent random variables, add them together, and divide by the number of random variables that were generated, this final random quantity is almost always normally distributed. In other words, as long as we calculate the mean from a series of n experiments, the particular details of the experiment do not matter. The mean will approximately be normally distributed. Now, 
You have probably noticed that there are a few parameters in the expression for the probability density function for the normal distribution that I have written here. These parameters can be called, can be computed quite straightforwardly, however. The mu that appears here is the expectation of the random variable x1 that was repeatedly sampled to calculate the mean. Similarly, sigma squared is the variance of this random variable. You will thus notice that if we calculate a mean from n random variables with expectation mu and variance sigma squared, that the mean is essentially a sample from a normal distribution with expectation mu and variance sigma squared over n. As we always perform multiple experiments, there is thus an argument for discarding every other distribution we have learnt about thus far in this course, and only ever dealing with the normal distribution in future, as the means that we sample are ultimately sampled from a normal distribution, or at least they can be approximated as such. As such. Before finishing with this remarkable result, let's consider one final thing, namely how the distribution that our mean is sampling from changes as we increase n, the number of random variables that we use to calculate the sample mean. As we have already discussed, the sample mean is a sample from a normal distribution with the same expectation as the underlying random variables and with a variance that is equal to the variance for the underlying random variables divided by the number of experiments performed. Consequently, and as shown in the movie on this slide, as we increase the number of random variables from which the mean was calculated, the position of the maximum in the distribution we are sampling from does not change. The width of this distribution gets narrower, however, as the number of samples increases. This concludes what I wanted to say about the normal distribution. We have seen that the normal distribution is important because the sample means that we compute by adding together most types of random variables can almost always be thought of as samples from a normal distribution. It is thus massively important that you learn the expression for the probability density function for a normal random variable by heart. To get you started, I have written an expression for the probability density function for a standard normal random variable, i.e. a normal random variable with expectation 0 and variance 1 on this slide. Learn this now, as in statistics you will see this function appear time and time again. Good luck.